like to is a financial support for this work. Uh, most important is the North American Carbon Program and USDA National Research Initiative and AFRI grants programs. Uh, they provided most of the grant support that has funded this work. Also, we've received equipment uh, grants from the National Science Foundation, uh, other support from Science Foundation Arizona, the Northern Arizona School of Forestry, the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and the Arizona Water Institute. So I really appreciate uh, the help from these agencies uh, to uh, fund our research. The context of the work that I'll talk about today has to do with uh, disturbance and it has to do with the ecosystem services of forest carbon sequestration and also forest supply of water. These are critical ecosystem services that forests provide to society and we're just now starting to really um, conduct some serious research on what influences the delivery of these services and the economic value of these services as well. Recently, it's been estimated by uh, Mike Ryan and others that about 15% of U.S. fossil fuel emissions are sequestered by forest in the United States. So that by itself is a large ecosystem service that helps uh, sequester carbon dioxide and slow uh, climate warming. Understanding of the controls over forest carbon and water balances by disturbances is poor. Many studies uh, historically focused on undisturbed forest, uh, national parks, or some sort of research or natural area that was not disturbed. And increasingly, we need to know much more about how disturbances from fire and uh, the silvicultural disturbances that we impose, such as fuel reduction thinnings and prescribed burnings, uh, impact the forest and carbon, carbon and water balances. And then at the bottom of this slide, uh, let's just acknowledge that the most common disturbances currently in southwestern Ponderosa Pine Forest are first, intense fire. I'm sure this audience is well versed in that. And then secondly, fuel reduction treatments that are aimed at reducing fire intensity. The picture in the lower right of this slide uh, shows an aerial view of uh, one of these fuel reduction treatments where small diameter ladder fuels are thin. Here's the outline of my talk today, and it's a fairly simple outline. Uh, I will first focus on the impacts of intense forest fire and secondly, on the impact of fuel reduction or restoration thinning on ponderosa pine carbon balance, number one. And then number two, uh, I'll address the impacts of those same disturbances on the water balance of ponderosa pine forest in the latter part of the talk. The research I'll talk about today is guided by this model of ponderosa pine stand dynamics. And I'm going to focus on the three forest conditions that are on the right side of the slide. Uh, one is an open forest condition. I tried to, to highlight next to it there. Uh, that open forest condition occurred in these forests for thousands of years prior to active fire suppression that started a little over a century ago. This condition was maintained by surface fires. Fire suppression, the dotted line here, uh, created dense forest over much of the landscape. Those dense forests, when they burn intensely in crown fires, often produce the third state, which is in the lower right part of the graph, a grass and shrubland. Now this grass and shrubland can persist for many decades, it also can transition to the fourth state, which is on the left side, the early successional forest. I won't talk about that forest type today, but uh, we are attempting to, to study that type in the future in terms of its carbon and water balance. So today I'll be focusing on an open forest condition created by restoration thinning activities applied to dense forests that are quite common on the landscape, and then number three, the grass and shrubland 
that often results from intense forest fires. The first data I'll share with you is from two sites, and the sites are shown here in this Google Earth image that's centered on Flagstaff in northern Arizona. The first site is a, a burn site. It's the Horseshoe Fire. I'm going to circle it here. It burned in 1996 north of Flagstaff. And the second site is similar to that site, but it did not burn. It's the control or unburned site. I just circled it. And the second site, the control site, is located on the NAU Centennial Forest just southwest of Flagstaff. Both of these sites uh, were dominated or are dominated by ponderosa pine. Uh, they are at a similar elevation and they occur on similar basalt-derived soils. Here are photos and some characteristics of each of the two sites. Starting on the left here with the unburned control site, you see a picture of it. And also in that picture is our instrument tower uh, in the middle of the picture. A little history and biological data on the site is uh, below the picture. This site is quite typical of dense ponderosa pine forest in the southwest. It was uh, heavily logged in the early 1900s. Most of the mature trees are about 90 years old. There are a few older trees that were not cut 100 years ago, but they're scarce. The leaf area index is high for the region, uh, about 2.2 to 2.4, and it's mostly in trees, not much her herbaceous production on the site. And then the basal area is quite high as well at about 30 square meters per hectare. On the right side of the slide is the burn site, and you see a photograph of its current condition 14 years after burning. And you can see that the fire uh, converted what was a dense forest into a, a grassland with a few shrubs. The pre-fire basal area was very similar uh, to the control site. And that basal area was estimated by measurements of the unburned uh, surrounding forest. You can see in the background of this picture. Uh, this fire occurred in 1996. It was part of the Horseshoe and Hochtefer fire complex. There has been almost no tree regeneration on the site. There was no attempt to uh, reforest the site by tree planting. And there was uh, very little to no post-fire uh, management on the site. So you can see standing snags and quite a few logs on the ground at the site now. Leaf area index of this burn site is very low. Uh, the peak leaf area index is about one square meter per square meter, and that only occurs in the month of August. Much of the year, the leaf area is much smaller than that, and it's all in herbaceous plants. First, I'll share with you our measurements of carbon stocks at these sites. This uh, graph has on the y-axis the uh, carbon stock, which I'll underline here, in grams of carbon per square meter of land area, and then the different stock components are shown on the x-axis. The first point I want to make is that the tree carbon stocks were very similar in the control and the burn stand prior to fire. That's shown here in the green oval, which I'll highlight, comparing the control in the red to the green pre-burned condition. So we think that these two stands had similar carbon stocks prior to burning. Secondly, we found that burning reduced total site carbon by about 40%, and that occurred 10 years after the fire, where it was measured 10 years after the fire. And that total stand carbon or site carbon is on the left side of the graph comparing the uh, red and the orange bar. Now that reduction of 40% was caused by various responses that I'll highlight here. One is that tree carbon uh, in live trees was reduced. I'll just circle tree above ground carbon was reduced to zero in live trees and the same for coarse root live carbon, 
because of the high tree mortality uh, caused by the fire. There was also a reduction in soil organic carbon uh, towards the right side of the figure. I just circled it. Uh, the forest floor uh, either burned or it eroded in the 10 years uh, uh, after the fire. Large reduction there. Another reduction that we did not measure directly is uh, combustion and decomposition. Our measurements were made 10 years after the fire, so certainly some of the live tree carbon and forest floor carbon burned, and then some also has decomposed in the decade to a decade and a half that has uh, transpired since the burning. There were some increases in carbon pools after the fire. Uh, one is that the coarse woody debris pool increased. I'll circle that on the graph here. And that's just the transfer of carbon from live trees to dead trees. And then finally, understory carbon increased. I'll circle that last. You can barely see it on the graph, on the graph because the understory contains very little carbon on, on this site. It increased three or four fold but its uh, contribution to the carbon stock of the site is very small. I'll be moving into a series of slides on the carbon balance of the site as measured by our eddy covariance system. So I'll take a moment here with this slide to explain briefly how this system works. Uh, it's a, a micro meteorologically based system where an instrument tower is used to sample uh, the movement of air above the vegetation, and we're interested in the vertical movement of air and energy between the atmosphere and the land. And along with the movement of air in these eddies that have a vertical component, which are shown with those oval loops in the right figure, we also measure changes of concentration of carbon dioxide and water vapor. From these measurements, we can calculate uh, on a, say, a half an hour hourly basis whether the uh, land is taking up CO2 or releasing it, and the same for water vapor. The lower uh, left photograph shows the instrument tower at one of our sites. And you can actually see where we sample the air above the canopy of the trees there. And then finally, the top photograph, which is a topographic map, shows uh, a depiction of the typical footprint or measurement area of the eddy covariance measurements. The tower itself uh, is a little black uh, rectangle sticking up there. And what this picture shows is that the measurement area depends a lot on wind speed and turbulence. When the wind is uh, very calm at night, uh, the footprint is quite large. I'll circle it at night. Uh, it can be 100 hectares, maybe even 200 hectares, because those eddies are very large and slow moving. However, uh, during a windy day, the footprint is very small, as shown by the purple here. The footprint under those conditions might be just 10 hectares or so. So we're measuring landscape level uh, carbon and water balances over a footprint that ranges from about 10 hectares to a few hundred hectares. Also shown in this picture are some stars that are just plots that we use for measuring biomass, some of that data that I just showed you on carbon stocks. This slide uh, shows uh, how the data can be interpreted in the context of the breathing of the ecosystem. And this is some very interesting data, I think, in the context of ecosystem ecology. Uh, it shows over a year of 30-minute measurements of the carbon balance of the burn site and the control site. The measurements start in October of 05 and go a little beyond October of 06. Uh, if we move uh, vertically from um, the zero axis up to 24 hours, that's a depiction of the uh, 24 hours of different 30-minute uh, measurements. So if we look at the burn site here, what we see much of the time is that the colors are green. This site has a very neutral ca carbon balance. 
uh, where it's neither taking in or releasing carbon dioxide. During the summer night periods that I'll circle here, the colors are yellow. This site is releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as a function of largely soil respiration, microbial uh, decomposition in the soil. And the only evidence of active photosynthesis and, a, and an active carbon sink at this site is what I just circled, the little blue area in September and October in the middle of the day. That green to light blue is the only time that this site is actually taking up more CO2 than it's releasing. If we move down to the control site, it's a heavily forested site. In the winter, December to February, almost a neutral carbon balance with a little bit of active photosynthesis during the day. In April, as soon as the nighttime temperatures uh, go above freezing, we see lots of photosynthesis during the day with those blue colors. We move to the middle of the summer, uh, June through August, we see uh, yellow colors at night, that's respiratory release of CO2. We see blue during the day, that's active photosynthesis. And then during July, we see a little patch of green in the middle of the day in July and part of August. Uh, that's just due to drought and the trees closing their stomates and stopping photosynthesis. So this is one way that we use this data. But another way is to take those 30-minute measurements and to calculate annual carbon balance for the sites, as shown here in this slide. And in this slide, it's called Annual Net Ecosystem Production, abbreviated as NEP. And this is just adding up the carbon exchange over all those 30-minute periods for a whole year. The NEP data is in grams of carbon per square meter per year. There's a zero reference line here. And the values that are positive or at the top or above the zero line indicates that the site is a carbon source to the atmosphere. And that is the condition of the burned site in the, in the white symbols. For each of five different years from 2006 to 2010, 2010, there we go, uh, this site was a net carbon source to the atmosphere. And there is a weak trend towards carbon neutrality. This line does have a slope suggesting that it's moving towards a neutral carbon balance, but that trend is based only on five years. It's very tentative at this point. The control site, on the other hand, lies in the carbon sink part of the graph, the negative values where the land is taking up CO2 and storing it. And you can see that the sink strength of the control site varies a lot over the five years. Uh, in 2006, the sink strength was high at about 180 grams per year per square meter. In 2009, interestingly, this site had almost a neutral carbon balance the sink strength was not significantly different from zero, indicating that these dense forests in the southwest have a lot of interannual variation in carbon sink strength. 2009 was interesting because it was a very severe summer drought. There was almost no monsoon rainfall in 2009, and we think that contributed to the almost neutral carbon balance at the control site in that year. Let's uh, add up the five annual values for each site. Those additions are shown in the bullets towards the middle of the slide. The burn site over five years released 292 grams of carbon per square meter over the five years. The control site, on the other hand, uh, took in about 560 grams of carbon per square meter. So the burning has really transformed the landscape from being a carbon sink to being a rather persistent carbon source, even a decade and a half after the fire. This slide just helps us understand why the burn site is a carbon source most years. Uh, this shows data on the components of net ecosystem production. I'm circling the uh, 
equation that describes the components. NEP equals gross primary production minus total ecosystem respiration. And if we look at the bottom of the graph here, we can see that for the burn site, which are the open symbols, total ecosystem respiration is greater than gross primary production in every year. And hence that site is a, a carbon source to the atmosphere. If we look at the control site, we see that GPP is greater than TER four out of the five years. And those are the years where it's a carbon sink. In 2009, those two values were about the same, and that's when the carbon balance is about neutral at that site. Next, I'll talk about the same control site, but we're going to throw in a thinned or restored site located very close to the control site, only eight kilometers away, where fuel reduction thinnings were implemented during the study. And here are some photos uh, of the site on the right side of the slide. Uh, before the thinning, you can see our instrument uh, facility there, uh, the bottom of the tower, the instrument shed. During the thinning, there were backhoes and loggers uh, working at the site, removing small diameter trees. And then after the thinning, here's the same site picture as, as here, and you can see that the tree density has been uh, reduced substantially. The thinning occurred over 167 hectares in the uh, footprint of the measurements and the thinning occurred in September and October of 2006. The middle of the slide shows some data on the effect of the thinning. It reduced tree density 70%, tree basal area 35%, and tree leaf area index by 40%. And then at the bottom of the slide is uh, data that Xander helped uh, produce, a nice paper by Finkrell and Evans on the diameter distribution of the uh, trees that were left in the thinning in the dark gray bars and the trees that were removed in the light gray bars. And you can see that the removed trees were small diameter trees. They all had a diameter less than about 45 centimeters. Just some more pictures of the thinning operation on the site. We use local contractors. Uh, the logs were uh, piled up and eventually used for firewood, sold for firewood. The slash was piled and burned on site. I want to speak for just a moment about the carbon emissions of the thinning and wood product utilization process itself. This is something that uh, is a very interesting in the context of full carbon accounting. And again, this is drawing from Finkrell and Evans. The reference is there for you. I encourage you to look at this if you haven't seen this paper. Let's just focus on this firewood, which was the actual use of the wood. They calculated that the thinning and the wood utilization and use released a fair amount of carbon, about 1,250 grams per square meter was released. 66% of that was due to burning of the firewood, 33% was due to burning of the slash piles on the site, and the remaining 1% was due to logging and transport and processing. So it really doesn't take much gasoline and fossil fuels to implement these thinnings. Most of the emissions are due to, to various types of burning, in this case burning firewood and burning slash. Um, they also calculated that 240 grams per square meter uh, of carbon would not be released if a fire had burned through the thinned area. And this was a result from uh, using the FVF system to model uh, carbon emissions. And then they calculated that the firewood, if it was actually used to replace fossil fuels in a biomass energy plant or by uh, heating a home, for example, with a wood stove, it could uh, uh, offset almost 700 grams per square meter of emissions. Then I made the same calculation for the carbon in the slash piles. That would be an offset if that slash pile carbon were used in a biomass energy plant. 
So what's really interesting to me is at the very bottom here, and I'm going to circle this area under net emissions and balance, the different uh, outcomes that come from adding up different components of this column. Number one, the thinning actually could be a small carbon sink if all of the firewood and slash were used to replace fossil fuels, all of it. Uh, the sink there would be 38 uh, grams. Number two, it would be a small source of about 312 grams if only the firewood were used to replace fossil fuels, but the slash was still burned on site. And then number three, it would be a pretty big source of over 1,000 grams if there's no fossil, fuel, fuel, no fossil fuel replacement. And this number three scenario actually I think is quite likely because the slash was burned on site and that still continues. And it is very likely that the firewood that was sold from the project may have been bought by campers at a, at a mini mart and they just used it to make a campfire and they didn't use it to offset any fossil fuels. So what this really shows is that the carbon balance of these thinning and wood products utilization projects depends heavily on the fate of the wood. If you look on the right side here, we see the carbon balance calculated if the wood is used for construction materials. And there it is a sink because uh, you're not burning up uh, the bowls of the trees and emitting CO2 immediately. Now let's uh, go back to carbon stocks and restoration thinning. Uh, this is the same sort of stock uh, diagram that we looked at earlier with the stocks in grams of carbon per square meter on the y-axis. We found that uh, thinning reduced total stand carbon only by 16%. And here we're comparing the orange and the green bars because we have pre-treatment data and post-treatment data. And that 16% resulted entirely from just removing live tree carbon above ground and in coarse roots. The only other detectable effect of the thinning was an increase in understory carbon, which I just circled in the middle part of the chart. The first year after thinning, understory above ground carbon doubled, but as you can see, it's barely detectable on this y-axis because it's such a small component. Here are the annual carbon balance values from the eddy covariance towers for the uh, thinned site, or I often call it the restored site, compared with the control site. And I'll make several points here. In 1996, prior to thinning, both of these sites were carbon sinks uh, of a similar magnitude, between about 125 and 175 grams. In the first year after thinning, the restored or thin site all of a sudden shifted to be a weak carbon source in the first year after thinning in 2007. The control site also shifted up, by, but uh, by not as much as the restored site. What's really interesting is what happened in 2009 and 2010 in the third and fourth post-treatment years. In those years, the restored site actually had greater carbon sink strength than the control site. And this was especially pronounced in 2009, which was the big summer drought, the year without a monsoon near Flagstaff, where the control site had almost a neutral carbon balance. But the restored site that had less tree area, leaf area and less competition among trees for water actually was a moderate carbon sink of about 125 grams. Let's add up the uh, carbon exchange or NEP values over the four post-treatment years. The values are remarkably similar. The control took up about 389 grams of carbon over those four years per square meter. The restored site was uh, statistically the same. Uh, about 400 grams. So this shows that these thinnings from below aimed at reducing fire intensity uh, do cause some very short-term impacts on the forest capacity to take up and store carbon, but those impacts 
are actually uh, hard to detect in the medium term because of the quick recovery of the site. And this uh, slide just shows one of the mechanisms of that quick recovery. We're looking at ring width derived from increment cores at the restoration site before and after thinning. If you look at the light gray bars compared to the black bars, it's easy to see that thinning greatly increased radial growth of the trees that were left on site. And we think this is the key mechanism by which these sites very quickly recover their carbon sink strength. I want to focus here on a role of drought in the carbon balance of the control and the restored site. Here we're looking at NEP data on a monthly basis. So it's NEP in grams of carbon per square meter per month. The same as the other slide, except this is per month. And then we see the five years of the study on the x-axis. First point is that in 1996, prior to thinning, these monthly values were almost identical for the two sites. During wet periods, which are underlined with what was intended to be a purple line, but I'll circle them here with the highlighter, during wet periods, the carbon sink strength of the control site was actually a lot larger than the restored site. You see it here and here and here, a much larger negative value, uh, greater carbon sink strength when it's wet in the late spring. However, the opposite is true when it's dry, which are shown with these red lines. During dry periods, such as the 19 such as the 2009 late summer drought, the control site was actually a carbon source to the atmosphere, whereas the restored site was a weak carbon sink. And we see the same pattern uh, during a dry year in 2010, right here and right here. So let me summarize five take home messages about our work on carbon balance. One is that carbon sequestration of southwestern ponderosa pine forest is quite low compared with most U.S. forest types. I've spoken about maximum amounts of carbon sequestration per year of uh, one to 200 grams per square meter a productive northern hardwood forest in uh, the northeastern United States or a Douglas fir forest in the Pacific Northwest could have values of four to 500 grams per square meter per year. So not surprising that carbon sequestration rates here are low, consistent with the low growth rates of forest in this region. Second, intense burning has um, large long-term impacts on site carbon sequestration if trees do not reestablish quickly. And this is a very important caveat about tree establishment. Uh, we know that if trees do establish very quickly after fire, that they can take up the carbon that was released uh, by burning. But in cases where these fires are causing long-term deforestation, there are long-term impacts in shifting these sites from being carbon sinks to being carbon sources. Number three, fuel reduction, restoration, thinning uh, can protect and stabilize carbon stocks, especially in larger trees. And we found that this type of treatment has very little medium-term impact on site carbon sequestration. And the impact is small because of the rapid recovery due to the rapid growth rate of the trees that are left on site. Number four, carbon emissions of thinning could, in theory and practice, be offset via wood use for long-lived products or use of the wood for energy production. That currently isn't done uh, well in the region, but it could be done if we wanted to to offset the carbon emissions of thinning and wood use itself. Number five, 
thinning ameliorates impacts of summer drought on carbon sink stream. We saw in an earlier slide that thin stands can be stronger carbon sinks than unthin stands during drought periods. I think this is very important given the increase in the frequency and intensity of drought predicted for the southwestern United States in the future. I'll briefly address our work on water balance. Uh, it'll go a little quicker than the carbon balance results. We first asked the question, how does intense burning affect water balance? And we address this question using a simple water balance equation, which I will underline here. This equation shows that the difference between precipitation and evapotranspiration is equal to the amount of water available for drainage uh, into the aquifer and to recharge uh, springs and seeps and riparian areas and the water that's available for runoff into reservoirs. In our work, we measure evapotranspiration, or ET, directly with the eddy covariance towers. And this graph shows that ET data on a monthly basis on the y-axis, millimeters of water per month for the control and the burn sites for the five years of the study. And one thing that you notice on the graph is that the burned site, the white symbols, symbols, often are lower than the control symbols in black. They're a little bit lower in the uh, late spring in particular. But both sites have seasonal dynamics of low ET in the winter and higher ET in the summer. If we add up the monthly ET values over the five years of the study, we get the values that I'll circle here in the middle of the graph. The control site uh, total ET was uh, 2,550 millimeters, or that's equivalent to 510 millimeters per year, very close to the precipitation on the site. The burn site is a little bit lower, 2,036 millimeters. Uh, it's 20 percent lower than the control site. So what this result tells us is that we can produce about 20 percent more water for drainage and runoff by killing all the trees on the site. It's actually not a large uh, difference considering that all of the trees were killed by the fire on the site. Here is the same sort of comparison but with the control and the restoration thinned site. Again, ET in millimeters of water per month. First of all, we see that the sites had identical ET prior to thinning, which occurred late in 2006. After the thinning, we see some periods where there is lower ET in the restored site with the white symbols compared with the control site and the black symbols, uh, usually in the late spring. Seasonal dynamics are about the same at the two sites. If we add up the four years of post-thinning values, we get the figures that will circle in the middle here. The control site ET was uh, 2059, same figure I just showed you earlier. The restored site ET was only 11 percent lower. It was uh, 1,838 millimeters. What's interesting about the difference in ET between the control and restored sites is that most of the difference was in the first several years, which are circled uh, here in the middle of the graph. By the fourth post-treatment year, there was only a 3 percent difference, indicating that thinning caused a brief pulse of water availability, but it was uh, very ephemeral. And by four years after treatment, there was virtually no difference. Okay, last uh, slide here. Let me just conclude about our work on water balance. Number one, remo actually killing of all the trees by an intense fire on a flat site can increase water for drainage and runoff by about 20 percent or so. And that's a pretty persistent effect over time. Uh, the caveat about a flat site is important. 
in that these results could be quite different on a mountain slide side where there is a lot of erosion, um, but that did not occur at our study sites, which were fairly flat. Secondly, typical fuel reduction thinning treatments will not increase water available for drainage and runoff much. We detected an 11% increase in the short term, and also the effect fades over time so that by the fourth post-treatment year, there was really no difference at all. So this idea that uh, restoration and fuel reduction thinning is going to create a lot more water for, for society and humans and riparian areas, I think is probably overstated. It will create a little more, but the stimulus will be very short-lived. After about five years, likely it won't be detectable at all. So with that, uh, I'll stop talking for a while, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was a really good presentation. The, the data you present is amazing, particularly the, the, the density over such a long period of time. Um, we got two questions that came in on the chat window, um, and I'll read those out. And then just to warn all the participants, I'm going to unmute you pretty soon here. So if you've got the radio blaring in the background, turn it off. The first question, Tom, came in from Don Falk, and uh, he had a question about slide 12. Um, and so maybe we'll uh, zip back there if we can. Um, you want me to zip? Or? I, I yeah. got it. Um, Okay. So he, he was saying that it's interesting that the years that have the weakest link, weakest sinks for the unburned site, 2007 and 2009, appear to be the best years for sequestration on the burn site. Do you want to comment at all about that? Well, um, there does seem to be a, a negative relationship there. I don't know if it's real or not. I mean, it's based only on two years. Um, I think what's probably most interesting and consistent about the two sites is that they both have a carbon balance closer to zero in those two years. So you can see that the burn site moves a little closer to zero in 2007, as does the control site, and the same is true in 2009. So that might represent just a suppression of biological activity at both sites. At the burn site, much of that biological activity is uh, in the soil via microbes that are breaking down you know, the dead root systems of the trees that were killed and are decomposing uh, the logs that are on the ground. On the, burn, on, the con tr on the control site, excuse me, that biological activity is, is more dominated by photosynthesis, which is suppressed in those drier years. All that speculation. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to ask you to, to maybe speculate a little bit more. Ted Huffman had a question about, um, or really an observation, about the carbon balance for stands that had a restoration thinning, but then were also burned. And um, maybe we'll, we'll think about the case where uh, this is after restoration and there's a broadcast burn sort of in a way that replicates uh, pre-settlement burns. Can you speculate a little bit about how that might, where that might fall in, in some of these other results? Yeah, I'd be happy to speculate on that. And I'll be, you know, I'll be drawing from just a lot of uh, fragments of results that are, I remember from various studies. But first of all, we, we know that prescribed burning can have highly variable effects on tree growth and mortality, which will influence the carbon balance. If the burn is light and mainly burns fine fuels and does not uh, damage or kill the larger, older trees, uh, the effects on annual carbon balance, I think, will be very small and very ephemeral. If, on the other hand, the burn has some hot spots and trees are defoliated or there are pockets of mortality, uh, we're going to see patches of that uh, prescribed fire landscape show a behavior similar to our burn site here uh, because uh, photosynthetic capacity will be lost and uh, carbon pools will be shifted from live trees to coarse woody debris. Then, of course, some will be lost in combustion as well. 
Uh, also, the frequency of prescribed burning is very important here. Uh, we've done some modeling work, and it's work that was published recently by Chris Sorensen, uh, Alex Finkrell, myself, and Ching Wang in Forest Ecology and Management, where uh, we modeled the, the difference in carbon emissions from prescribed burning of a thin site every 10 years versus every 20 years. And the uh, burning frequency over a century had a, had a big influence on the carbon emission. There was substantially less carbon emitted when that burning occurred every 20 years over a century compared with every 10 years over one century. So burning frequency is another issue as well that we need to understand more about. Thanks. And, and I think now um, I'll try to unmute everybody. And um, if people have other questions, they can chime in on the phone line. So hopefully now other people, uh, participants, will be able to hear you as well. Are there other questions? Um, you can also type them, of course, in the chat box. But are there other questions from participants? I have a question. This is uh, Sharon Masek lopez at NAU. <clears throat> I was wondering, on the treated forest, was that a fairly homogeneous treatment? And if you had um, a, a pattern of forest post-restoration that was more heterogeneous with bigger openings and, and groups of trees, some different kind of configuration, could that have any effect on the ET? Yeah, hi, Sharon. That's a good question. Um, about the treatment at our site, the thinning treatment at the restoration site was based on the uh, ERI uh, replacement tree model. And it was, I think it was the uh, 1.5 slash 3 replacement tree model. Now, because this site had a lot of evidence of old uh, pre-settlement trees, a lot of trees were left on the site and they were spaced fairly uh, equally. Uh, that wasn't the intent of the prescription, but that's the stand structure that the prescription produced, was something that almost looked like a plantation that was uh, thinned using spacing guidelines. Oh. <laughs> um, in terms of the effect of these different types of treatments on ET, I think you can look at our two treatments to bracket the range of, of effects. If you look at the burned site where all of the trees were killed, the uh, ET was reduced on average by about 20% uh, or so. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the maximal effect that we could have on ET via a very aggressive thinning action, and that action would be killing all the trees. On the other hand, the thinning that we studied uh, resulted in a much uh, smaller effect of an 11% difference in ET with most of that difference in the early years. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the situation you describe where there'd be a mixture of openings and groups, I think would be bracketed somewhere in between that 20%, which is r killing all the trees, and the 11%, which was a fairly light thinning from below. Somewhere between 20 and 11% would be my guess. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Sure. Let's see, Gretchen Fitzgerald just uh, asked a question in the chat window, and she asked if, uh, Tom, you might be willing to speculate about what the results would be in a pine gamble oak stand uh, compared to your site, uh, given that the gamble oak re-sprouts after fire and thinning. Yeah, Gretchen, that's a very good question. It's one I've thought about. Um, let me just uh, acknowledge that our sites had a little bit of oak, but they were not much of the leaf area. Uh, the oaks were not thinned, so there were a few oaks there, but certainly at lower elevations, there are more oaks mixed in with ponderosa pine, and they do aggressively re-sprout after uh, thinning and burning, as you said. Um, my prediction would be after an intense fire that the oaks would dominate the site much more than any coniferous species for decades following an intense fire. And in fact, there have been many cases of this vegetation conversion from 
a pine oak mixture to an oak and other shrub sprout uh, ecosystem following intense fire in the southwest and in Mexico. And I think that this rapid resprouting is going to uh, recover the site capacity for carbon sequestration much more rapidly than the situation we studied where that sprouting was not an important influence. On our intensely burned site, there were no oak sprouts and no resprouting shrubs to speak of. So the uh, forest was converted to a, a grassland largely. So I do think recovery would be faster where you have aggressive uh, gamble oak resprouting and resprouting by other uh, shrubs. I don't know how much faster. I'd love to uh, study that with some more eddy flux towers. Other questions out there? Well, we're just about at uh, 1 o'clock, and so um, maybe we'll wrap it up here. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar available in case um, you wanted to review a particular part of it or uh, share the, the recording with a colleague uh, who might have missed it. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have other webinars through the Southwest Fire Science Consortium in the coming year. Um, in January, we have a look at the, the hydrologic effects of severe fire. And then through much of the spring, our webinars will focus on um, some modeling and um, the, giving people the opportunity to learn about flow foam and land fire and, and some other modeling um, at, uh, elements. So again, Tom, I'd like to thank you. It was an excellent presentation. Um, and uh, it's funny because I thought I knew some of this stuff, but uh, I learned a lot on this call, and uh, I'm sure everyone else did as well. Thanks to all the participants. Great questions. and. Um, I'm going to dismiss everybody now, and um, so we'll, I'll shut off the phone line, but thanks so much. And if you have questions or comments, please feel free to follow up with me via email. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.